This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. Well, at the end of last session, amongst other things, I left you there to have a look through that expenditure, the list here in section four of this chapter, of expenditure that would be allocated to the special rate pool. Sadly, as we've seen, the word special here is not really the special one when it comes to capital allowances, because it's special in a bad way, i.e. you don't get as much writing down allowance in terms of special rate pool expenditure as you would with main pool expenditure. You're only getting 6% per annum rather than 18% per annum as you would in the main pool. We still therefore need to recognise when given a list of expenditure regarding usually plant and machinery, which of that list is going to be allocated, has to be allocated to the special rate pool. We also learn that if you have a mix of both main pool and special rate pool expenditure that ranks for AIA and the total of that list of expenditure combining main and special root items comes to more than your AIA limit, it being a £1 million for a 12-month period, then because it's a lower level of WDA that would be available in the future for the special rate pool expenditure, as compared to your main pool, you would allocate the AIA firstly to the special rate pool. So it would then be the main pool expenditure that would take you above your AIA limit and the excess above it will only rank for WDA, but at least it'll be 18% instead of only 6% as it would if that was special rate pool expenditure. Hopefully you've had a little look through there. Again, like everything in this subject, of course, it is a learning exercise. But at this point, this distance I assume it is now from where you are currently to the exam date, just familiarise yourself with this. Again, those things that are pure learning exercise, like lists, like the admin stuff, you leave until, I recommend anyway, closer to the exam. So we had the one that we actually mentioned. It was already in the notes when we first introduced the idea of the special rate pool expenditure, and that is integral features of a building. And we give the examples as listed there. Again, some pretty major items in terms of the level of expenditure that would be involved. Another one akin to that is the thermal insulation of a building as well. One that uh, is worth watching out for, and that's long life assets. We're talking plant and machinery, but long life plant and machinery. How do we define that? Well, it's assets when new that would have had an expected economic working life of 25 years or more. So typically a question would say, bought an item of plant there that had an anticipated expecting working life when new of 30 years. 30 is more than 25, and on that basis, therefore, it is a long life asset. And like it or not, that makes it special rate pool expenditure. Now, of course, as we kept saying, if your total of expenditure is within your £1 million AIA limit, it doesn't matter because you get all of your available capital allowance, 100% in the accounting period in which you incur that expenditure. But if there would probably be set up a question whereby you've got a combination of that total expenditure that comes to more than your uh, AIA limit, then as we've said, you would allocate the AIA Firstly, to this special rate pool expenditure. So those long life assets, when new, expected work, economic working life, 25 years or more, when the total expenditure based on a 12 month period exceeds £100,000. So if you're told that two such items were bought during the period, one for £80,000, it itself is not in excess of £100,000, but another item for 50,000, 80 plus 50, 130, that exceeds 100,000. So those two items will be allocated as long life assets to the special rate pool. Now, all of those, those first three, those are expenditure items 
that would rank for A by A. But we learnt last time about one particular asset that would always be allocated to the special rate pool. And that were these motor cars with CO2 emissions above, over the 50 gram per kilometre limit there. And the point, of course, about cars is that they do not qualify for AIA. So do remember that these motor cars with the higher CO2 emissions don't get AIA. They will go to the special rate pool, wherein only the 6% WDA is available. OK. So look at a couple of examples there. Firstly, illustration two. Again, what do we have to do? Calculate the capital allowances for the year ended March 22. Now, you could have such an example being a two mark question in section A, or of course, it's a part of a section C question. So what have we got here within this accounting period to the 31st of March? And it is, of course, the year end. So given our AIA WDA, it's 12 months and therefore the full amounts will be available. Stephen prepares accounts to 31st of March. We are introduced now, as this is a continuing business, to the fact that we had a tax written down value on the main pool at the start of this period, the 1st of April 21, was £40,000. So you immediately know that you need a main pool within your capital allowances computation, irrespective of whether there is any other expenditure this period that may be allocated to it. We need the main pool, and the first figure we'll put on our computation is that tax written down value brought forward. We then got the transactions that took place during the year ended March 22. And again, as we look through these, we'd be jotting down here exactly what allowance they would be eligible for. So we've got just normal basic plant item, £50,000 there. So that would mean that's eligible for AIA. We've then got a car. Now, a car is never eligible for AIA. The question is, depending on the type of car that it is in terms of its CO2 emissions, do we simply get a writing down allowance? In which case, is it going into the main pool and getting 18% or is it going to the special rate pool and getting just 6%? Or do we get 100% first year allowance? And again, all of that is based on the CO2 emissions. Again, the emission levels that we don't have to uh, remember. It's again information provided to us on our rates and allowances. But I have a feeling that we will be remembering this. And that cutoff figure, of course, was 50 grams per kilometre in terms of is it main pool, is it special rate pool. Now here we've got purchased a motor car for 11,200, CO2 emissions of 40 grams per kilometre. So that therefore is below the 50 limit. So that's going to be allocated to the main pool. Again, as a car, there's no AIA available. We've then got a car costing 14,100, this time with CO2 emissions of 70 grams per kilometre. Now we've gone above that 50 grams per kilometre limit, and therefore that is going to be special rate pool. And then to finish it off on the 15th of March 22, just before our year end, we purchased a new electric motor car with zero CO2 emissions, and that was costing 14,400. Zero CO2 emissions on our new electric car, and that therefore means we've got a first year allowance. So we set our computation up. Now, again, if it is a written question in section C, this must be, again, structured properly, formatted in this way. Always on the far right hand side of our page will be a column to record the allowances. Always on the inside column, we'll have a column to record any AIA or FYA expenditure. We are likely to always have a main pool. We had inherited one here at the beginning of the period. And again, we then need to be on the lookout for any special rate pool expenditure. And probably the one most likely is the car as we see here with the higher CO2 emissions. So 
having set up the relevant columns that we now need from analysing the information in the question, let's get on with recording those transactions and that detail on the computation. Firstly, as ever, the tax written down value brought forward. It's a main pool balance into the main pool it goes. We then list out, of course, those additions that qualify for AIA. That was simply the plant purchase for 50,000. It's a 12 month period. We're nowhere near the one million pound limit. So, of course, the AIA is 100%. We take the full 50,000 and into the allowances column it goes. There is no residue left over to go into the main pool. We then list out those cars that will qualify for writing down allowance. Remember, there's never AIA, but as we've already discussed in this problem, it's a question of do we get IA? IAAA. <laughs> do we get AIA or is it FYA there? <laughs> Easy for me to say. So here we've got uh, two cars that uh, will rank for WDA. We've got the lower emissions car that we've already determined will be allocated to the main pool and the higher CO2 emissions car that will be allocated to the special rate pool. The one that has zero CO2 emissions, that is dealt with last of all on this computation after the WDA has been computed as being additions that qualify for 100% FYA. So we put the two cars with CO2 emissions into their relevant pool, it updated the balance as it is for main pool, and what do we then do? The writing down allowance is 18%, the full 18%, this is a 12 month period for the main pool, and 6% for the special rate pool. Again, deduct from the balance on the pool those two figures and allocate into the allowances column. Nearly there, only one other thing to do, deal with the additions qualifying for the 100% FYA, which is only those new electric uh, cars with uh, zero CO2 emissions. That costs 14.4, all of which is 100% FYA, into the allowances available column, doesn't impact on the tax written down values of either pool, and just add up the capital allowances available to you there. And the job is done. Again, in the section C question, you are likely to have to take that figure of 74,462 and deduct it, of course, from the adjusted trading profit that you've already computed to get the bottom line tax adjusted trading profit figure. OK, now again, if needs be, pause at this particular point to go back through that and make sure you're happy with what we have done. Otherwise, we progress on to look at illustration three. Now what we've done this time is to bring in a whole lot of expenditure that is eligible for AIA, it being a mix of both main pool and special rate pool expenditure. And that means that if we do, as we will here, exceed the AIA limit, you have to decide which expense item, main pool or special rate pool, gets first crack at any available AIA. What have we got? Accounts prepared to December at the 1st of January 21. Yep, we're dealing with the year ended the 31st of December 21. Here we had a written down value brought forward on our main pool. So a main pool column will be required it was 22,000 pounds. What happened then during the period we bought machinery for 45,000, that's eligible for AIA. We purchased a long life asset. Now I've told you it's a long life asset here. Again, it could have been, they told you that they bought a long life asset. Uh, sorry, they bought here a specific item of plant that had, uh, again, uh, an economic working life of uh, 30 years when new. And on that basis, it is long life. And clearly the expenditure here exceeds £100,000. So it too is eligible for AIA. And we know we've now got a total, that individual figure indeed is more than, 100, more than £1 million. 
Wouldn't be an exam question without a motor car coming in. CO2 emissions of 45 grams per kilometre. Now, with 45 grams per kilometre, doesn't exceed 50. That, therefore, again, it's not zero emissions, so there's no FYA here. So it will be a WDA. And, of course, to which pool do we take it? Well, I won't tell you. You'll be able to work that out for yourself in a moment as we go through the answer. Right, so we've got our uh, counting period set up. We know, again, that we need our allowances column on the far right-hand side. We need our AIA stroke FYA column here, into which we'll allocate the relevant expenditure. But first of all, pick up the tax written down value brought forward, as it always will be given in the question. We then have our long life asset, the one that would be special rate pool expenditure, that will be eligible to claim the AIA and will take first crack at the available AIA. Well, that is, I say only one million, you know, put thousands of pounds here. We don't got too many noughts going on. The other columns are just pounds. So we've got one million and thirty thousand pounds worth of long life asset purchased. So that will consume all of the one million pound AIA limit. And that goes into the allowances available column. It will still leave the 30,000, as you see there, to be allocated to the special rate pool. Again, we'd have set this up having already seen that the special rate pool expenditure incurred in the period had already exceeded one million pounds in its own right. So there was always going to be that 30,000 to go into the pool. We knew we had a main pool because we had the tax written down value brought forward. And of course, we haven't finished with it yet. Because there are two additions that qualify for AIA. And of course, the second one is the main pool expenditure. That was just your normal item of plant and machinery, 45,000. There's no AIA available. You've already used the maximum there on the special rate pool expenditure, the long life asset. And therefore, that 45,000 will be allocated to the pool upon which, of course, we will eventually claim our 18% WDA. But not before we have allocated in this motor car that was bought in the period, which with that lower level of emissions meant it was main pool expenditure, not special rate pool. So on your balances in your two pools, take your WDA at 18% for main pool, 6% for special rate, get the figures, They'll be deducted in deriving, if you needed it, the tax written down value to carry forward and allocated into our allowances column, where we'd have the huge amount of over a million pounds worth of capital allowances available to us there. OK, the sort of question, because again, you, you wouldn't expect to see such a, a, uh, an unincorporated trade anyway, but there's huge amounts of expenditure that would probably be a separate standalone uh, Section A objective testing two mark question. OK, on we go. We've dealt so far with the purchase of various items of plant and machinery, and we should now be able to allocate all of that qualifying plant and machinery expenditure into the correct part of our computation. Was it an addition that qualified for AIA? And if it was, was it main pool or special rate pool expenditure there? Was it cars that we had bought? And you always bet in an exam question, you're going to see cars involved somewhere or other. Now, if it's got CO2 emissions of any level, it's not first year allowance, only zero ele new electric motor cars with zero CO2 emissions attract FYA. So anything, therefore, other than that that's been bought, there's no AIA, but it's WDA. Then are the CO2 emissions of that car within the 50 gram limit or above? Is it main pool? Is it special rate pool? But now what we may have to deal with is not only during the period do you buy plant and machinery of various different types, but you sell plant and machinery as well. So what happens then? 
When plants and machinery is sold in the accounting period, the sale proceeds, but with a limitation, up to a maximum of the original cost of the asset is deducted from the balance of the unrelieved expenditure of the relevant pool, before then computing the WDA of the accounting period in the normal way. So on our computation, we picked up tax written down value brought forward. We added in the additions that rank for AIA. We then added in the additions that rank for WDA, i.e. cars there, and sorted out which went to the main and which went to the special rate pool. But at that point, instead of then getting your balance on your pools and taking your WDA as we did in the, uh, uh, the earlier example, what we now do is, of course, to bring in the deduction of the sale proceeds to reduce whichever pool is relevant. Like, for example, you sold a car that originally had CO2 emissions of 90 grams per kilometre. On that basis, therefore, it would be in the special rate pool. Look at the sale proceeds, deduct those proceeds from the current tax written down value you have to get the balance upon which then the WDA will be available this period and you take your relevant percentage. So we therefore are going to deduct the sales proceeds either from the main pool, if it was a main pool item, or the special rate pool, if it was a special rate pool item there. And that deduction will reduce the balance on the pool for then us to have our WDA calculation. One thing to watch for, shouldn't really be an issue in real life, but it's certainly an issue in terms of exams. And that is, yes, we do deduct sales proceeds, as it says there, but up to a maximum of the original cost. Now, it is, as you might think, incredibly unlikely that any asset that has been bought by the business for use within its trade is subsequently, years later, going to be sold for more than the original cost. It's not a likely proposition in reality. But this is the exam, so it's a very likely possibility to test out whether you know this rule. And the rule is, if you've got, for example, original cost 10,000, and now you sell for £11,000, the proceeds are 11, that's the figure you think you'd be deducting, but oh look, they told me the original cost. The proceeds is more, you can't deduct more than you originally put into the capital, com capital allowances computation, that was 10000 we now take 10000 out. That is it. Can't take out more than you originally put in. The fact that this asset has been disposed of for more than you paid for it, that begs a question of whether there might possibly be any capital gain to compute. But that's a chapter 12 for us to consider. It's a separate issue. But here in the capital allowances computation, yep, we deduct sales proceeds, but only up to the maximum of the original cost. That, of course, being on each individual asset. So important to understand here that the WDA computations will continue through to the cessation of trading. So we know that when we sell off assets, then assuming that there's still a balance on the pool, if we don't have that, we'll talk separately about that just a little bit later. But then those balances being on the pool are eroded with smaller and smaller amounts of WDA because we calculate them on a reducing balance basis. And we're saying, therefore, that those WDA computations will go through to the cessation of trading of the business, even if all the items of plant and machinery that were in that pool had been sold by the business. So don't be tricked here by the examiner when you're told that this particular sale during the period was the only asset, the remaining asset, that was within that pool. It doesn't matter. So if you had £30,000 as a tax written down value brought forward 
and you're then told sold off all of your remaining plant and machinery for £10,000, that being a lower figure than its original cost, then you've got your 30000 brought forward, if that's the number I said, take out your 10000 proceeds, it's less than the original cost, and that still leaves you 10 from 30 is £20,000 in the pool. You don't get to now take all of that as an available capital allowance. You've got a tax written down value to carry forward of 20000 And next year, you'll take your relevant WDA. It'll drop a bit more. And year on year on year. So you, even though any assets that were in the pool might now have been sold, you no longer own, the pool lives on. The only time it will come to an end and what we'll call eventually a balancing adjustment will have to be uh, created, it will arise in relation to the sale. The only time that happens is on the cessation of trading. So please, if you get a question where, yeah, this sale of plant and machinery is all items of plant and machinery that were in that pool, you deduct the proceeds, you take the WDA, and you keep doing that WDA all the way through to the end of the trading of that particular business. The business would still be able to continue trading because, again, a lot of people say, well, if you sold off all your plant and machinery, haven't you therefore de facto ceased to trade? No, you haven't. You may have decided that rather than buying new, you will now, for example, have decided to rent, to lease the plant and machinery rather than purchase. Again, the examiner doesn't anyway have to justify what is going on. That is what happened. You've got to deal with it. Now, I've said there that when we sold for £10,000 the remaining plant and machinery, then there was a tax written down value uh, within the pool of 30000 It left £20,000 and that then lived on for future WDA calculations each year. But there is a time where if it is a small amount within the pool, that we can then effectively write off all of that expenditure with a WDA claim for the entire amount, so as to leave zero within that pool. So, where the tax written down value of either, either of the two pools, the main pool or the special rate pool, prior to calculating the WDA of this period, is less than 1,000. So remember what we've done. We brought forward a balance. We took additions in that rank for AIA. We've taken out our disposals. And then, be it the main or be it the special rate pool, the balance on that pool now is not to uh, £20,000. It is a figure less than £1,000 then the entire balance may be taken as a WDA in that period. But again, though, the £1,000 is prorated if the accounting period is other than 12 months. Again, the 1000 is based on a 12-month period. So there, we can mop up, simply because it's not a very big number. And rather than taking 18% or 6% on a figure of less than a 1000 and only getting smaller there, Instead of doing that, the HMRC is like, just have it all, just have it all, wipe it all out. You don't want to do capital allowance computations. We don't want to be checking those computations in future years for such very small numbers. That leaves you, therefore, with example one, where we're dealing with Beth, and the requirement is to calculate her capital allowances for the year ended 5th of April 22. Information that we've got obviously prepares account to the 5th of April, and we're looking at the year to 22 there. At the start of the tax year, there was a written down value, a tax written down value on her main pool of £1,250. So that's your tax written down value brought forward on the main pool. She purchases machinery for £10,000 there. Well, basic machinery, that is eligible for AIA and is considerably less, of course, than £1 million. Therefore, it will be 100% AIA. We then sell an item of plant for 500 the original cost 3000 So clearly here, as you'd anticipate it to be, 
In all practical senses, the proceeds are of course less than that original cost. But when of course you take that away from what was your tax written down value brought forward, it will leave you with a figure of less than a thousand pounds. And what can we therefore do? We take this small pools WDA claim and take the balance of it, all of it, rather than taking here as it's a main pool, just another 18% this year and next year and next year, etc., etc. We can write it all off at this point. So, won't take you long, but if you could just pause for a few minutes, please, while you deal with the numbers to that particular problem, and then come back and join us. Well, let's have a quick look here at what we've hopefully got in answer to example one here in chapter five. We've got our accounting period for which the capital outs computation is prepared. We have a tax written down value brought forward at the start of this accounting period. It's a main pool into the main pool column it goes. We've got an addition, yes, but it qualifies for AIA. AIA at a level of 100%. That takes out the full amount of that expenditure and it goes into our allowances column, of course. We then have our disposals, take out the disposals. 500 proceeds being less than original cost. And that brings you down to a tax written down value of 750. Now, at that point, it would be usual for us to take our available WDA on the residue expenditure left within this main pool. And because it is a main pool, we'd be taking an 18% figure. But this is where the small pools WDA claim comes into play. And that is because this figure, at the point where we would normally take our WDA, that figure is less than a thousand pounds. And that therefore means that rather than continuing with just smaller and smaller WDA figures ad infinitum into the future, we can instead take it all in one go with a small pools WDA claim for the full amount of 750. And we get that therefore in our allowances column. Total for the period, and again, the normal way, deduct from the adjusted trading profit to give you the tax adjusted trading profit. That would leave you with nil residue in the main pool. It would then be on to the next accounting period to see what happened. Again, what expenditure was incurred, whether it just AIA was available, or indeed, whether anything went into the main pool. Like, of course, uh, a lower CO2 emission car there something that didn't exceed 50 grams per kilometre anyway, and we'd be able to get our 18% writing down allowance as it would be a main pool item. Okay, again, probably not something you'd see in a written question. That is rather more like you'd see in a Section A objective testing question. Back to our notes, therefore, now, and we come to an important area. An important area, at least in income tax, when dealing with the unincorporated trader. What we have is the situation up until now, where after you've taken your AIA, if we've got any expenditure that goes in excess of the available AIA, added to then any figure of tax written down value brought forward on a pool, but the expenditure that we'd have would either go to a main pool or a special rate pool. The whole point of the exercise is that we didn't want to maintain separate and individual exercise, uh, <laughs> computations for 437 different individual assets. Put them in a pool, do one WDA claim each accounting period. It makes life easier and it's sensible. But there is a situation where we see there are certain categories of asset here that are classified as non-pool assets, meaning that they're going to have to have their own separate and individual column on the face of that capital allowances computation. Now, there are two categories here which may be applicable in terms of income tax and the unincorporated trader. By far the most important and most well-tested is this first one. Assets that have private use by the business owner. That is as distinct from an employee within that business for whom that car or that asset has been provided. Again, normally, again, a bit of giving the game away a little bit there, but normally, if we're going to see an asset that has private use by the proprietor, by the owner of the business, it's not going to be some plant and machinery equipment that's sitting in the factory there. It's going to be a car. 
a car, therefore, that has been provided for the owner of the business, he or she has ensured that, that they put their car through the business there. But of course, that car is not going to be used 100% for business purposes. There's going to be a degree of private use. So only part of it will be business use. So where we have assets, most likely cars, with private use by the business owner, they, those cars will not go to either the main or special rate pool. Again, that would have been based on CO2 emissions. But he said it's kept separate. Now, of course, it's still a car where there's no AIA. And this type of car we're talking about at the moment has got CO2 emissions. So it's no FYA. So it's going to be WDA. And that figure now goes into a separate column set up for it. It would be a car with, as we'll see with an example in a few minutes time, a given proportion of what the business stroke private use is. Now, often that figure is just given. You are told that the car has 60% business use, 80% business use, 40% private use. Now, be careful here whether they give you the business use or the private use element. What is going to happen is we will only be able to claim the business use proportion. So do make sure you don't get the two percentages mixed up. If they've given you the private use, then the other bit is the bit that you can claim. If they've given you the business use, that's the bit of the capital allowance, as we'll see, that you can claim. They may just tell you, as I've just suggested there, percentage figures. Or what they might do is to say, the total mileage of the car during this particular year, uh, during this period, rather, uh, assuming it was a 12 month period, was 10,000. And of those 10,000 miles in total that have been uh, uh, driven in that car, there were 6,000 business miles. So you've got 6,000 business miles out of 10,000, 6 out of 10, that's 60% business use. So you might have to do a little calculation there for yourself if they don't overtly give it to you as a percentage number. OK, so the most likely one you're ever going to see in terms of maintaining a separate column for this non-poor asset is an asset there with private use by the business owner. The other possibility is what we call, and we'll see later, short life assets on which the taxpayer has made a depooling election. Well, the clues in the name there, depooling. The taxpayer has decided, for whatever reason, as we'll see later, to take an asset that would otherwise have gone into a pool and then separated it out and said, I want to keep that as a non-pool asset. Why and where we do that, as I say, we see later. Now, that one doesn't come up very often. It does come up, but it's not like this one, the first one, the assets with private use by the business owner. Be careful here. We have some of the same rules, certainly in terms of the capital allowances. What are they? AIA, WDA, FYA, available now in income tax to the unincorporated trader. But when we look at corporate tax later in our studies, then companies too are eligible to claim capital allowances. When we deal with companies, there are from this year onwards, unfortunately, some very special separate rules that only apply to companies. Good news for companies because they get bigger capital allowances. <laughs> Not such good news for you because there are other rules that you now have to learn. Whereas before, it was basically what you did in income tax, you do in corporate tax. So it's created some more work for you. But it is good news as far as companies are concerned. But if you're dealing with a corporate tax problem, I mention it now ahead of the time. I'll mention it again in corporate tax. You are not going to see assets with private use by the business owner. This is peculiar to unincorporated trade, where the owner of the business uses that particular asset, probably a car, partly business, partly private. That is not going to happen in a company. Also, in the unincorporated trade, where we will see it, it is still only then private use by the business owner. As these later notes will go on to say, 
if within an unincorporated trade, there is an employee of that sole trader or partnership, an employee, not the owner, not an owner of the business, that has a car provided for him or her by the business, then that doesn't matter whether or not there's a mix of business or private use. It doesn't matter in capital allowances. Where it will matter is later on in chapter nine, because an employee has been provided with a car by their employer. That is a benefit provided by an employer and therefore has to be dealt with within the employment income assessment. So it is caught up within the taxation system, but not here, not in capital allowances. If a car is used privately by an employee, it will still go to either main pool or special rate pool, depending on those CO2 emissions there. It doesn't impact the availability of the full capital allowance. Only where in income tax we have this private use by the owner, the proprietor of the business, do we have to separate out. So again, make sure you only perform this exercise where relevant. It's only relevant in income tax and it's only relevant when dealing with private use by the business owner, not by an employee of that business. The short life assets, well, probably if you are going to see it, that one probably would be in a corporate tax exercise, but could come up in either. But we're going to focus to begin with on by far the more important of these in terms of the number of times it comes up in the exam. Obviously, whichever one comes up in your exam is the most important, but this side of your exam, I don't know. So, but this one, you definitely, definitely need to know and know well. Okay, so what have we got? We've said where an asset is used by the owner of the business, and that could either be the sole trader or a partner in a partnership. We're dealing with unincorporated trades, of course. And that asset is used partly for business and partly for private purposes. Again, by far the most likely example is a motor car. Only the business proportion of the available capital allowances is given. This proportion is computed by reference to the percentage of business use to total use. And as I said to you a moment ago, those percentage uses, business or private, may be given to you overtly within the question, or they give you the total mileage and what portion of that is either private or business, so you can work out what the business proportion is. Then we have these rules that must be followed when computing the capital allowances. Right, the cost of this particular asset. So once we've identified its income tax problem, its private use by the owner of that business, Therefore, now I have to separate it out and treat it as a non-pool asset. As I say, 90 times or 99 times out of 100, that is going to be a car. But the cost now is not brought into the main or special rate pool, but must go into its own separate column on the computation. The chances, as I've said, are that it will be a car that does have CO2 emissions. And that means that there will be a writing down allowance that is available. Based upon those CO2 emissions, it will either be 18% or 6%. The criteria we previously used to allocate that expenditure to one or other of the pools, but not now. This will go to its own separate column. Equally, you could have an asset that may have qualified for AIA or FYA, the FYA, of course, the zero emission there, zero CO2 emission, new electric car, or any other item of plant. But whatever it is, most likely the WDA, but possibly AIA, possibly FYA, those allowances are calculated on the full cost, but only the business proportion of any allowance is actually given. So we'll compute what is the relevant allowance. Again, let's assume for the moment that we are talking about a car with CO2 emissions. We'll take 18%, we'll take 6%, whichever is relevant, based upon those emissions. But then the bit of that allowance that can actually be claimed 
is restricted to the business use proportion. It's restricted to the business use proportion. Let's have a little example to illustrate that. And as luck would have it, we've got a little example set up here. Now we're going to look at a little capital ounces computation for a sole trader business for, uh, we'll go through probably three accounting periods, starting with the year ended 30th of June 21. So if you set this up as I talk you through it here, what we've done is to in inherit at the start of what was the year ended June 21, as ever, a tax written down value brought forward, given in the question. And of course, they'll tell you that it is on either a main and or a special rate pool. This is the main pool. We're then told here that during this particular period, there was one addition. And that addition was a car. A car that had 35 grams per kilometre as its CO2 emissions. Now that would mean, in terms of what we know, it doesn't exceed 50 and therefore an 18% WDA would be available. And if this had no private use by the business owner, we do as we've done previously so far in these studies, we would put that cost figure into the main pool and then proceed to take our 18% WDA on whatever was the then tax written down value eligible for that WDA. But what I'm going to tell you this time is that it is, of course, a car that we've got and there is some private use. So the business use, sorry, if you can't read that, that doesn't say blues. It is business use and the business use there is, say, 80%. Now, again, they could have said private use 20. It doesn't matter how you do this, but personally, I'd always put in at the top of this column, what is the percentage that is business use? Because that is the bit that you're going to be able to claim. And we'll say that that car bought was £30,000. So we've been told in the question, Tax written down value bought forward, one addition during the period, bought a car with 35 grams per kilometre as CO2 emissions, and that that car was used by the business owner to the extent of 80% business use, 20% private use. So we've now allocated, as we always do to begin with, an expenditure of the period to the correct column within that computation. We also know that there's going to be allowances available and of course here had it have been necessary it wasn't here but we'd have had our AIA stroke FYA column had it been necessary there it wasn't here it's these two columns to begin with that are relevant on the main pool and on the car with the 80% business use okay so we brought forward our balance from the previous period we've added in the additions of the period we look to see if there are any disposals. No, there aren't. And therefore, now we calculate our writing down allowance. Now, on the main pool, it will, of course, be 18%. So we do 18% on the main pool. Well, it's 20,000. So 2 times 1,800 would be, what, 3,600. Do check my numbers in case my mental arithmetic fails me here. £3,600 of WDA. We then look at the car that has got the 80% business use. Based on those CO2 emissions, it too is eligible for an 18% WDA. So now we'll claim that. And that figure in full, before being impacted by the fact that there is private use by the owner, that figure is computed and deducted here in this computation. And that therefore would be uh, three times 1800 is going to be 5,400 pounds, methinks. And that figure would be deducted before then calculating the tax written down value to carry forward. That would be done next. But what do we have in the form of allowances? Now on the pool, 
the 3,600 claimed goes across, of course, and is available in full in our allowances available column. But then this £5,400, well, that's not now all available. We've computed and deducted the full available allowance in getting what would then be the tax written down value to carry forward, which presumably there would be 24600 So we've written that 5-4 out of the qualifying cost in relation to future capital allowance claims. But we don't get to claim all of that. Can we give myself a bit more room here? We don't get to claim all of that. And this is why we wrote in the business use proportion at the top of the column. We get to claim just 80%. So you compute what is 80% of that 5,400. Well, 8 times 540, 8 times 4,000, 80% of 40 is 20. So I think £4,320 worth of capital allowance. Again, if that's not the right number, apologies. But whatever is 80%, that is the figure that you take there. You would then, of course, add up the two allowances available, your WDAs for the period, and that, as ever, would be deducted from the adjusted trading profit of the period. You've got your tax written down value now to carry forward on the non-pool asset. You'd also have that on your pool. 3, 6 and 20 is what, £16,400. And on you'd go into, well, that was the year ended, what was the year end? Uh, 30th of June 21. So on now to the year ended. Oh, hello, what's happened there? I've got two of them. Hmm. I've now got the year ended, the 30th of June 22, as the accounting period. And we'll say that there were no additions or disposals during this accounting period. And as there were no such additions or disposals during the period, what's going on with this? I'm sure I wrote in year end there. Yeah. Okay, we wrote in, let's try again. We got the year ended, 30th of June 22, moving on to the next accounting period. There's no additions in this period, and there's no disposals during the period. So all we have is our writing down allowance claims, 18% on the pool, 18% on your private use car there. And what I'd like you to do now is to compute for me what the capital allowances would be. I've decided that these numbers I can't do in my head, so I'll get my calculator out and do them, and then we'll come back together and compare notes to see whether we've come up with the right figure. So pause at this point and you just fill those numbers in, please. Okay, let's, let's see, therefore, what we've got on this one. For this next accounting period, the year ended 30th of June 22, we brought forward the tax written down values at the start of that accounting period. There were no additions or disposals in this period. Therefore, we claim the relevant WDA on those balances. There is the main pool balance on which we take our 18%, which hopefully is 2952 all of which transfers across and is available, of course, as allowances of this period. The 18% on then the car that has this only 80% business use, this non-pool asset, that I hope is 4,428, as I put in there. That would be deducted in deriving the tax written down value then to carry forward, but only 80% of that figure will be available in the capital allowances of this period. So take 80% and again, check the numbers, please. If I put the right numbers to the calculator, and I got that to £3,542. Add up the two allowances available, 6494. Those are your capital allowances. Do with them as you always do. Deduct from the adjusted trading profit to derive the tax adjusted trading profit figure. So we go on and on like that, so long as the non-pool asset was still owned. But there'll come a point, and for us, that point will be in the year ended the 30th of June 23, where that particular non-pool asset here, the car, will be sold. So what do we do then? Well, to know that, we go back to the notes. 
So here, back in note 6.1, part C of the note, we now see what happens on disposal. Because this is a single asset pool that we're talking in terms of, a non-pool asset, sometimes referred to as a single asset pool, by the way, there, hence that expression. But this non-pool asset's got its own separate column. If it is sold, then that must be cleared out of the capital allowances computation. It's not going to continue on. It's not like where you have balances on the pool. And even if all the contents of that pool expenditure had gone, they'd been disposed of. Because it was a pool, it lived on. And therefore, that would carry on with ever smaller amounts of WDA all the way through to the cessation of trading. But here with the non-pool asset, when it is sold, what is referred to as a balancing adjustment must be established to ensure that over the period of ownership, we collected the correct amount of capital allowances. So what are we told? On disposal of the asset, a balancing adjustment, there's a term you're going to have to get to grips with, a balancing adjustment is computed. So what are we going to do? Obviously, we'll pick up when a sale occurs, the sale proceeds, always, of course, to a maximum of the original cost. But deduct sales proceeds from whatever the tax written down value was. And then a balancing adjustment will arise as the difference. Now, that difference could either be a positive or a negative figure in terms of do you sell it for more or do you sell it for less than the then tax written down value. So there will be a balancing charge. That's the type of balancing adjustment this is. If the sale proceeds were to exceed the tax written down value. So if you sold for more than tax written down value, that would be called a balancing charge. And what that means is that it would be as like a negative capital allowance and would reduce the other capital allowances available for the period. That would be a balancing charge. That would be bracketed in your allowances column. That will reduce the allowances of that period. If, of course, we sold it for if sale proceeds are less than tax written down value, then it would be a balancing allowance. So there's still some amount of allowance that you are due to take. And that, therefore, would be the final balancing allowance, the last bit of the capital allowance that you were entitled to. That, therefore, would be taken. And then that column, again, would be closed. That would be it. All of the capital allowances that you were due to have, you have had over the life of the ownership of that non-pool asset, and now it's gone from the capital allowances system. Having computed the balancing adjustment, the amount assessed or allowed is then, of course, still reduced to the business proportion. At the moment, we've only deducted the sale proceeds from the tax written down value, and either we've exceeded that tax written down value with the proceeds and got a balancing charge, or it was less than the, uh, the, the tax written down value, we've got a balancing allowance. But those figures are not now the numbers to go into the capital allowance column. A balancing charge will reduce the capital allowances of the period, as I've already said. A balancing allowance is just the capital allowance of the period. But the bit that is to be claimed as a balancing allowance or to be charged as a balancing charge is again restricted to the business use proportion. So a balancing allowance is then added to the capital allowances of the period, whereas a balancing charge will reduce those capital allowance. If you did get the situation where a balancing charge exceeded the allowances available, then the net balancing charge, if that were to happen, it's unusual, but it could happen, that would be added to the adjusted trading profit of the period, just the reverse of a capital allowance. Again, you would add it to the profit. It would increase the profit rather than reducing that profit. So when this non-poor asset is sold, deduct the sales proceeds from the tax written down value, that you'll either sell it for more than or less than the tax written down value, 
If you sell for more than the tax written down value, it's a balancing charge. But the figure to go into your allowances column as a negative figure, bracketed figure there, that is going to be the business proportion. In our example, 80% of course here. If we sell for less than the tax written down value, that is a balancing allowance. But again, the bit to go into your allowances column would only be the business proportion, the 80%. So in terms of our example here, what I'd like you to do now is to assume that that non-poor asset, that car, that currently has a tax written down value of what, 246 less 4428 there, so just a little over 20,000. Can you now assume, to begin with, that it was sold for £18,000? Assume it was sold for £18,000 within this accounting period. So you'd bring forward again your tax written down values there. We would then take out our disposals as there were no other additions. It will be the disposal of this particular car. It is the non-pool asset over to the non-pool column. And I think I said, let's assume to begin with that we sold it for £18,000. See what balance that gives you. Identify it as either a balancing allowance or balancing charge. And then once you've got that number, take the business proportion of it, that was 80%, and put that into the capital allowances column there. What you've also got to do, of course, here, that is your balancing allowance or balancing charge, as the case may be. You have to define which it is. You'd also have, of course, your normal 18% WDA on the pool. Okay. Have a go at that now, please. Let's see what numbers we get here. And of course here, and whether that's bracketed or it's not bracketed as the case may be, what net capital allowances, what capital allowances there are available for this accounting period. Over to you just to get those numbers in, please. Pause again at this point in time. Well, let's see if we're both looking at the same answers there, you and I. We had our tax written down values brought forward into the year ended the 30th of June 23 on, as we know, the main pool, where quite simply, with no other transactions of the period, we took an 18% writing down allowance. That I got to 2421, and that transfers into the capital allowances column. The more important issue for us, the new component, was the balancing adjustment that's going to arise in relation to our disposal of the uh, Again, private use asset, the one with here as it was 80% business use, that car. We brought forward our tax written down value at 20,172. We've sold for 18,000. Now, clearly, the difference between what you've sold it for and the higher tax written down value is 2172. That, however, is not the balancing adjustment because we take the business use proportion of that number, that being. 80% there. And that will come to, well, I made it anyway, £1,738. What type of balancing adjustment is it? Well, we had written down the asset to a tax written down value there of 20172 but we sold it for less than that. And if we sell for less than the tax written down value, then the balance that arises is a balancing allowance we are still due more capital allowances given that we've sold it for less than its then tax written down value. So that 1738 there will be a balancing allowance. And what that means is that we would add that 1738 to the other capital allowances of the period. So the final capital allowances of this period will be the 1738 plus the 2421. That is a balancing capital allowance. Add it to the other capital allowance of the period, and that would be the figure again to then deduct from the adjusted trading profit of that business to derive the tax adjusted trading profit figure. Again, 
that's the process that you undertake and you won't do anything other than what I've shown you there. Um, again, just for the sake of spending just an extra minute on this, just to prove here that actually the system works in the way that it should. What we've seen is that that car was bought for £30,000. It was sold there for £18,000. So you've suffered a loss in relation to that. Your net cost of 12000 you bought it for thirty, you sold it for eighteen. That net cost is what should then have been eligible for capital allowances. Now that would be £12,000. And of that net cost, you're only eligible to claim 80% in terms of your capital allowances, because that's the business use. 80% of 12,000, I think 8,296, so £9,600. And if you added through the capital allowances that you have had, and you could do this in your own time now, looking at what was the capital allowance claimed in the first, in the second accounting period, plus then the balancing allowance of this period, well, if we've done it right, so I hope we have, then the sum total of those three figures should come to that 9,600. Where did I get the 96 from? Bought for 30, sold for 18, net cost 12,000 pounds. That should be compensated for within the capital allowance system, but only to the extent there was business use. 80% therefore of 12,000 is I think there 9,600 pounds. Now you'd never do that check in terms of an exam question. Just if you were worrying, well, why am I doing it? Oh, there's the question, why again? Then. It's just proving to you that, yeah, actually we've got the right outcome overall here, but that's an end to it now. What I would like you to do, however, is one final exercise on this to bring this particular session to a final end, is there we sold for £18,000. Could you just now assume that you sold for 25000 Assume you sold for 25000 What then, please, would arise? Already pause at this point and have a little exercise. Do that exercise, please. Okay, so hopefully, therefore, what you've ascertained was yep, there's your tax written down value brought forward, itself saying 20,172. This time we've sold for 25,000, so we've sold for more than the tax written down value. How much more? Well, I made that £4,828 there. But that won't be the balancing adjustment. We take 80% of that, the business use proportion, and that came out to 3862. You can see I bracketed it here because we've actually sold for more than the tax written down value. That's a balancing charge. If you sell for more than the tax written down value, it's a balancing charge. What that means is you've actually, given the net cost you've suffered, you bought for 30 and you sold for 25, that you've actually claimed you've been able to get too much capital allowance there. 30 down to 25, uh, that's 5,000 there at 80%. Uh, your business use proportion means you should have had 4,000 capital allowances. And if you added up the two that we've had in the first two periods and deducted then that 3,862, then again, you should find that that comes to the net capital allowance that you're entitled to. But again, don't do any reconciliations in the exam. This is the process. Simply on the non poor asset, deduct the sales proceeds from the then tax written down value coming into that accounting period, the one in which it was sold. If you sell for less than tax written down value, you are due extra capital allowance, a balancing allowance added into the capital allowance of the period. If as here, you've sold for more than the tax written down value, then that effectively means you've had too much capital allowance over the period of ownership, and therefore, again, restricted to the business use proportion, you take and compute the balancing charge. What would you do with that? You'd net that against the other capital allowance of the period. And if as would probably be the case here, that figure was therefore to be, what was the other figure for this year? We had 2,421 on, I think, the pool there, that given that that's 3,862, it would give you a net balancing charge. If that were to happen, all you would do is when you go back to your uh, adjusted trading profit from the adjustment of profits exercise, instead of deducting what would have been a net capital allowance, you simply add in what is a, effectively a net balancing charge.
so it would increase the trading profit for the period rather than decrease it. Okay, again, make sure you're happy with those numbers there. Let's just go back to finish this off to that note in relation to those uh, private use of the asset by the owner of the business. And emphasizing that point, but it's an issue we discussed on our introduction to this, that the private use by an employee of an asset owned by the business, again, typically, of course, a car there, has no effect on the business's entitlement to capital allowances. So we do not, therefore, separate out or restrict the capital allowances where it is merely private use by an employee of that business. It's also why the private use of an asset is irrelevant for companies. There is no private use adjustments in corporate tax when dealing with capital allowances. Directors, for example, are treated as employees for this purpose. Instead, there will normally be, as we said earlier, an employment income assessment. You have an assessable benefit here in relation to the use of a car provided by the employer, and that would be an assessable benefit in relation to, well, the employee, the director, they're both employees of that particular company. There's no separation there's no private use adjustment for capital allowances there. OK, between now and next time, therefore, there you go. You've got example two for you to have a go at to work out this time James capital allowances for what is the year ended December 21. And you'll find there that we've got indeed uh, a couple of assets acquired. Strangely, cars, of course, there, unsurprising, where private use is made and you've got to work out or see by whom is that private use made of that car provided by the business and decide accordingly what to do within the capital outage computation. So do that, check it out. Again, hopefully I'll remember at the start of next time, I'll quickly review that. Otherwise, as usual, if you have any questions in relation to the exercise that we've done or the things that we've done covered in the lectures, then again, use the Ask the Tutor forum. Look forward to seeing you next time.